please open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. We begin tonight in 1 Peter chapter 3, and it's our intention to make it through the entire chapter. The chapter itself divides itself very neatly into two sections. The first section mainly talks about submission, mainly in the home and in the marriage. It's continuing on the thought of submission from chapter 3, excuse me, from chapter 2. Then in the second part of the chapter, it has to do with enduring (laughs) suffering as a believer. So let's take a look at the first part in the beginning here, verses 1 through 7, where it speaks about submission in the Christian home. He says here, verses 1 through 2, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. The first thing I want you to know about verse 1 is to notice the word likewise. Likewise means we're connecting back to what was been said before. It's not exactly the same word as therefore, but it's much the same idea. In light of what we've said before, we're going to talk to you now about submission in the home. And he says, wives, right there, verse 1, be submissive to your own husbands. You see, previously in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter told us about having submission to the government. That was in verses 13 through 17 of chapter 2. Then he spoke to us about having submission towards our employers. He used it in the master-slave relationship. He ended chapter 2 with some words about demonstrating the surrendered heart of Jesus in our submission. But mainly, notice the thing, it's a very familiar teaching on submission in the New Testament. He's talking about submission in several different spheres. The submission that we have to the government, the submission that we have to our employer, the submission that we have in the home. And what I want you to understand is when the Bible speaks about this idea of submission, it usually does speak about it in several different spheres. Paul does the same thing in his letters. In other words, he's not just trying to single out submission belongs in the home and that's where it really matters. No, submission is a principle that every Christian has to deal with In some way or another, it's just God has appointed different spheres for us to respond in different uh, aspects of submission. Now, I I want you to understand something, that the call for submission in the Christian life, it is not just a call for love and considerate action. To say submit isn't just saying, well, be nice and get along. I'm all for being nice and getting along, but that's not what the idea of submission really is. What submission is in the biblical understanding is this. It's a call to submit to rightful authority. But this is what you have to understand. Submission to authority can be completely consistent with equality in importance, dignity, and honor. In other words, um, in an employer-employee relationship, or you could say it as it's expressed many times in Scripture, a master-slave relationship. The slave is not instructed to submit to the master because the master is more important or better or, or, or somehow intrinsically better than the slave. No, it's because it's an observation of God's appointed order of authority. I want you to consider this. Jesus was subject to his parents. It says that he obeyed them in all things. Was Jesus greater than his parents? You better believe he was. He was the Messiah, the Son of God. But Jesus submitted to them. Jesus submitted to his Father in heaven. But we know from the full teaching of the scriptures on the Trinity and the nature of God that the Son and the Father are equal in their deity. It's not like the Father is more God than the Son. They're equal in their deity. This frees us from one of the carnal instincts that we have about the idea of submission, whenever we hear submission, we usually think inferiority. And that's not the biblical idea at all. No, what it is, it's an order of authority. So that's one thing I want you to understand. The second thing that I want you to understand about submission is this. In every sphere of human authority and submission, God never commands absolute submission. If anybody starts laying that stuff down on you, 
you, you, you better get that antenna, that Holy Ghost antenna up and get a big warning signal. If anybody acts like you're supposed to submit to your pastors, right or wrong, biblical or unbiblical, they're in a position of authority, so you must submit to them, that's, that's dangerous. The same way with your government or with your employer or in the family for a child to submit to the parent or a wife to submit to the husband, absolutely with no question. No, we have the principle in the scriptures that we are supposed to obey God before man. And even if a legitimate authority tells us to do something that's sinful, we're not supposed to do it. Sometimes it gets down very practically. Years ago, when I pastored in another congregation, a wife came to me and said, my husband's telling me to sign the tax return, and I know that it's fraudulent. I said, what would God have you do? She knew very well what God would have her do, that it would be a sin for her to sign a fraudulent tax return. So she refused to sign it, and I support her all the way. And, her, and the husband saw the, the uh, nonsense of what he was doing, and he repented of it. But ladies and gentlemen, we're not supposed to sin in the name of submission. Now, when Peter writes here in verse 1, wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, I don't want you to think that he's picking on the wives any more than in chapter 2 he was picking on citizens or in chapter 2 he was picking on uh, employees. He's just talking about how submission works in various spheres of life. But this teaching about submission would be especially relevant to a first century married woman who began to follow Jesus. Just think of the scenario in your mind. Here's an ancient married couple, and neither one of them know Jesus, and then the wife comes to faith in Jesus Christ. This would raise all kinds of radical questions in the woman's life. She would ask questions such as this, should I leave my husband now that I'm a Christian? She would ask questions like this, should I change my behavior towards my husband now that I'm a Christian? Or how about this, should I assume that I'm superior to my husband because now that I'm a believer? I'm a daughter of the king, and you're a rank pagan. No, Peter's saying, no, no, no. In this context, you need to understand that you're to submit to your husband. In the culture of the ancient world, it was almost unthinkable that a wife would adopt a different religion than her husband. It, it was like that, that was a totally outside-the-box thought. But Peter here understands in the kingdom of God, it happens all the time, and God can even use it. Here's another thing I want you to notice about verse 1. If you like to underline things in your Bible, underline this, the word own. What does it mean? Be submissive to your own husbands. Listen carefully to what I'm going to say here. The Bible nowhere teaches a general submission of women unto men. Nowhere. Peter was very careful to write this, and so was Paul. Submit to your own husbands. The Bible teaches that there should be male leadership in two spheres, the sphere of the church and the sphere of the home. That's it. It doesn't say that women should submit to men in the spheres of politics, in the spheres of economics, in the spheres of business, in the spheres of education, so forth and so on all throughout. The Bible never teaches that. It just doesn't. It does say that there should be male leadership, I'll repeat it again just so it's clear, in the church and in the home, but that's it. So there's no general subordination of women unto men taught in the scriptures. It says be submissive to your own husbands, but notice the payoff here, it's in verse one, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. You see, one benefit of submission is shown in the way that it can affect a husband for God. A wife's submission should be a powerful expression of her trust in God. This kind of faith and obedience can accomplish great things, and it can accomplish it. Notice that phrase there in verse 1, even without a word. 
Now look, whenever you're talking about the areas of marriage and family, you're talking about very different lives, very different marriages, very different dynamics. I, I, I always hesitate to say that there's like this one size fits all with every problem, with every, but you know what? But the principles are pretty consistent throughout. And I'll say this, in my 30 plus years of ministry, I've seen several times this kind of dynamic. A woman is married to an unbeliever, and she's been preaching at him for 20 years, and it's gone nowhere. The more she preaches at him, the harder her heart, his heart gets. And she's preached, and she's preached, and she's preached. And, and, and she's maybe, in the midst of all the preaching, kind of adopted a, a spiritually superior, you know, kind of attitude. You know, husband, won't it be great when you can finally come up to my level? You know, that kind of thing. Which is kind of the opposite of a submissive attitude. And then she reads this verse. And she understands it. And she takes it to heart. And she says, you know what? Maybe if I submit to my husband the way the Bible says, and maybe if I just really trust God to do that. Because listen, there's probably somewhat of a reason on his part why she hasn't submitted to him in the light of, Maybe he's a big jerk and difficult to submit to. I'm not talking about violence. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm just talking about general jerkiness, which is fairly common among the male species. So I'm not saying that he's been any kind of dream to submit. There's been a reason why. So listen, you know what that submission requires on her part? A lot of trust in God. But she says, all right, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to stop preaching at him. And I'm going to live the way you tell me to live. And God does things. Now, listen, I I'm not saying this is like some kind of absolute promise. Because I've known women who have done that. And there's been no dramatic change in the husband. But still, you should do it because the scriptures say to do it. But notice this, the potential reward that Peter notes, that they may be one without a word. There's a sense in which a wife's efforts to shape her husband through her own words and efforts may hinder the power of God working on the husband. It's much more effective to submit in the way that God says to, thus demonstrating trust in him, and to let God have his way with the husband. Sometimes I picture it like this, and look, this is just my own mental picture. Take it or leave it as you please. But I picture sometimes it works like this. The, the poor wife, and I do say the poor wife because she's in a difficult position. Oh, Lord, would you get to work on my husband? Get to work on my husband. And God's saying, when you get out of the way, I'll get to work on, my hus on your husband. And at least sometimes that's certainly been the case. Now, continuing speaking to the woman here in verse 3. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Now, again, he's still speaking to the wives, to the women. He says, listen, if you want a kind of an example of this heart, this attitude that I'm looking for you to have, it's a kind of heart that would not, look at that phrase in verse 3, not let your adornment be merely outward. Please notice, Peter's not forbidding outward adornment. But he's saying for the godly woman, outward adornment is always in moderation. Her emphasis is on inward adornment. He says, for example, don't go crazy in the arranging of the hair. According to William Barclay, a great commentator, well, he's not always great. Sometimes he's goofy, but sometimes he's great. He says that in the world that Peter lived, hair was a big deal among women in the Roman Empire. They uh, spent a lot of times on their hair. They would wear elaborate wigs. Especially popular were blonde wigs made from hair imported from Germany. Uh, Peter had this in mind, speaking of the adornment that's merely outward. Uh, again, Peter's not forbidding a woman from fixing up her hair. Uh, he's not forbidding a woman from wearing jewelry. I mean, after all, if these things were forbidding, it would forbid a woman from wearing apparel. 
I, I mean, look at that, that's what it says. It says, or putting on, notice the word fine is in italics, or putting on apparel. No, the, the, the idea is just do things in moderation, but more importantly than that, more importantly, verse four, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart. Real beauty comes from the hidden person of the heart. You're not gonna see that on TV. You're not gonna see it from the advertising world. But it's true. Real beauty comes from the hidden person of the heart. It isn't fundamentally something you wear or arrange before a mirror to have. Real beauty is something you are. Every one of you women know some other woman who is outwardly gorgeous, but inside she's poison, she's ugly. And there's something about the outward beauty that you can admire. You know, yeah, there's something there. I mean, she looks fantastic, but what a poisonous, ugly person she is on the outside. The real question is something like this. What are you gonna depend on to make yourself beautiful? Peter's point isn't that, you know, the hair, the jewelry, the clothing, all those are fine. But listen, if that's what you're really relying on for your beauty, you're looking in the wrong place. Matter of fact, notice this, and this is what should really interest us. Verse four, he speaks of the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Do you know what incorruptible beauty is? Incorruptible beauty is beauty that doesn't go away. Now, um, everybody in this room is getting older. Some of us just feel it more than others, but every one of us is getting older. And um, it can be a frightening thing for a woman who has lived her entire identity by her outward beauty to feel the sting of getting older because there's something corruptible about outward beauty. It, it decays, it goes away. There's just, I mean, look, how many of us, how many of us have, have known a woman who's older and she's beautiful? I mean, she's going, man, that's a good looking woman. Just, she's beautiful. And then you see a picture of her from 30 years before and you go, whoa. I mean, look, she looks great now, but look at her then. And, and you just, you're just struck by it. Do, do you realize that there's a beauty from the inner woman that is incorruptible? Matter of fact, it gets better with the years. Ladies, this is the greatest kind of beauty to have. But without ignoring those other things, but the incorruptible beauty only gets better with age and is therefore much greater value than the beauty that comes from hair, jewelry, or clothing. Now, he's gonna give an example of submission here in verses five and six. It says, for in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. In other words, Peter isn't calling them to a new standard. He says, listen, th these things were done by godly women in ancient times. It was practiced by those holy women then. What did they do? Look at verse five. These ancient women, they trusted in God. Listen, a, a woman can trust in her ability to control and influence her husband. How am I gonna make my way in the world? I'm gonna control that man who, who holds the power. A woman can trust in her ability to put things over on other people through her charm or her beauty. A, a woman can trust in all kinds of things, her own power, her own ability, her own charisma, her own magnetism. You can trust in all those things. Or you know what else you can trust in? The Lord. You can trust in the Lord. What a difference. How much of stress that puts in your life. You see, this cultivation of this gentle and quiet spirit all comes back to a trust in God and being like those holy women of old who trusted in God, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham. That's the example that he uses from the scripture. How did Sarah uh, demonstrate her trust in God? Well, first of all, she obeyed her husband, even when it was difficult. 
Listen, if you obey your husband, if you submit to your husband only when you agree with him, that's not submission. Everybody can submit when they agree. Who cares? That's like nothing. Um, but, but to submit when it's difficult, as Sarah did, that's another thing entirely. But then Sarah did another thing as well. It says that she honored Abraham by calling him Lord. Now, I've tried to use this one on Ingalil, and she's just not in the habit of calling me Lord. I, I don't know what the problem is around the Guzik house. We have had a laugh about that every once in a while. You know, I'll kind of point the verse out to her, and she'll roll her eyes, and rightfully so. The, the idea isn't literally to call your husband Lord, but it is to respect him and to honor him. And when, when a husband feels that his wife doesn't respect him, Ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's, that's a dangerous place in a marriage. Now, sometimes a husband's feeling of not being respected is not rooted in truth. Husbands can make up weird things in their minds about this. But where it does have a foundation in truth, the wife needs to realize that, that just as much as she needs to feel nourished and cherished and prized by her husband, the husband needs to feel respected and honored by his wife. It is possible to obey someone without showing them that you really honor them. Peter's saying that just submission and obedience is not enough. There should be obedience and honor. That's what a true heart of submission is. Now, look at verse 7 because we don't want to ignore that. He says, husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Notice this. First of all, I just want you to get the, the principle here, how radical this is. In the thinking of the ancient world, in a marriage, all the obligations were on the wife, and there were zero obligations on the husband. In the thinking of the ancient world, if a husband found out that his wife was committing adultery, he had the right under Roman law to murder her on the spot, and the law would approve of it. The wife had no similar privilege against the husband, zero whatsoever. All the rights, all the responsibilities were on, excuse me, all the rights were on the side of the husband. The woman only had obligations and responsibilities. What Peter does in verse 7 is radical. He says, hey, husbands, you have obligations also. They're not only on the side of the wife. Why did Peter address the wives first? Because in the broader context, he's talking about submission. But he doesn't want to leave it. It's like, husbands, you have an obligation. What is their obligation? Number one, dwell with them. A godly husband lives with his wife. You say, well, duh. Listen, in a lot of homes, the husband doesn't really dwell with his wife. They're roommates. They live in the same walls under the same roof, but he doesn't live with her. He doesn't dwell with her. He doesn't really have a sense of the unity and oneness that God wants a husband and wife to have. Peter says dwell with her. Secondly, he says do it with understanding. A godly husband undertakes the important job of understanding his wife. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a big job, isn't it? There is something sometimes unfathomable about the female mind and heart to a husband. But at least a godly husband's going to give it his best to try. He's going to, I'm going to work to understand this woman. Not only am I going to really live with her as one in honoring the oneness that God has placed between us, but I'm gonna do my best to really understand her. I'm gonna demonstrate my love for her more effectively by living with her with understanding. And then, I'm gonna give honor unto her. I'm gonna show her honor. Even though I know the Bible tells me that she's supposed to submit to me, I'm, gonna make, I'm not going to make her feel like an employee. I'm not going to make her feel like a slave. I'm not going to make her feel like a subordinate. I am going to honor her. Again, let me remind you, this was a radical teaching in the world Peter lived in. 
Husband, honor your wife. Make her feel special, honored, cherished. Here's another one. Consider her as being the weaker vessel. That's also what it says in verse 7. Now, there's been a lot of debate what Peter actually meant by that phrase, weaker vessel. I I think he meant just basically physically weaker. Look, I I don't want to sound completely sexist here, but but it's kind of shocking how much weaker the average woman is than the average man. It's it's really shocking, the, the disparity. Now, I say average, because I know there's probably five women in this room tonight who could beat me in arm wrestling. So I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm not trying to, you know, go there. But I'll just give you something that interested me some time ago because I just ran across, I wondered how how many women have run a four-minute mile. Now, a four-minute mile is kind of a, a, a standard for strength and endurance among elite male athletes. And there are, I don't know if there's hundreds, probably hundreds of men have run a four-minute mile. I know that there's at least into double figures of high schoolers, high school men who have run uh, four-minute miles. Do you want to know how many women have run a four-minute mile? Zero. Not even close. It's not even on the horizon. And, And that's not lifting weights. That's running. I mean, women can run marvelously. But, but, it's not even on the horizon that a woman is going to run a four-minute mile. I mean, nobody can even predict when it's going to be because it's so far away. These kind of things show how, physically speaking, the average man is so much stronger. Well, consider that, men. Consider that there's burdens that should not be placed upon your wife just because God made a disparity there. Love her, honor her, cherish her as the weaker measure. And notice this phrase in verse 7, as heirs together, a godly husband realizes that his spouse is not only his wife, but also his sister in Jesus Christ. And part of their inheritance in the Lord is realized with them together. You're not only my spouse, you're my sister in the Lord. And I have to love you and care for you as my sister in the Lord as well. Listen, some of the most effective marriage counseling I've ever done with people is to go to the passages of Scripture that speak about how we should treat one another in the body of Christ, just how we should treat everybody. You know, we should love each other, forgive one another, be long-suffering towards one another, not be angry with them. I mean, just go through the Scripture and see how one Christian should relate to a Christian, and then just apply it very, well, don't you think you should treat your wife or your husband like you would treat any other Christian? Forget about any specialized teaching on marriage. Let's begin just by treating each other as Christian brothers and sisters, as heirs together of eternal life. (coughs) Now let me show one more thing from verse 7. Time's getting a little bit away from us, but he uses this phrase in verse 7 that's very provocative, that your prayers may not be hindered. The failure to live as a godly husband has spiritual consequences. It can and it will hinder prayer. Now, some people have thought that this means that it'll only hinder the prayers that the husband and wife pray together. I don't think so, because he's addressing this to the husband, and he's seeing it in the singular, that your prayers, it's you, husband, your prayers. There are prayers that God will not answer as long as you're being a jerk as a husband. And you know what's strange? Many Christian men pray so little and and are so uninterested in really trusting God for things that can be measured, they wouldn't even know if God is answering their prayers. But this should be a warning signal for the Christian life. God's not answering my prayers. Something's wrong. Maybe I need to give more attention to my wife. It's a very real dynamic. Now, let's talk about the second half of the chapter now, starting at verse 8. We'll have to move through this half a little more quickly. But the general theme of the second half of the chapter, verse 8 to the end, is godliness in suffering. So let's talk about this, starting now at verse 8. He begins with a plea for unity and love among God's people. He says, finally, all of you, be of one mind. 
I can't pass this up, how he begins verse 8, finally. Look, he's halfway through the book and he's saying finally. This is a true preacher at work. You know, it's like his first conclusion here. But this is, this is classic. Anyway, finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Notice, first of all, what he says here in verse 8, be of one mind. Now, I, I can't pass up the thing of just tying it together with what we just saw. Did you notice how many marriages would be improved just by obeying verses 8 and 9? T- take that just together in a marriage. He's talking about how we should treat each other in the body of Christ, but it's a powerful expression of what we should do together in marriage. But notice he says in verse 8, be of one mind. Now, this is a very easy verse for us to follow. Be of one mind. How can we together be of one mind? It's so simple. You just be of my mind and everything's fixed. (laughs) Isn't that the way we think? That's the easiest thing in the world. You all change to conform just the way I want you to. If everybody would just agree with me, things would be great. Listen, that's exactly the trap we don't want to fall into. We want to be of one mind, but what is the one mind we need to be of? Paul said, the mind of Christ. That's why we need to be into our Bibles and into the Word, so that we can know the mind of Christ to the very best of our ability. Verse 8, having compassion on one another, tender-hearted, courteous, Peter described the kind of warm love that there should be among the people of God. We need to be compassionate, brotherly, tender-hearted, polite with one another. And then he says in verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Listen, the greatest challenge to our love for others comes when we're wronged. Look, as long as everything's peaceful and good and we're all great, it's wonderful, Patrice. But you know what? When you feel that I wrong you or I feel that you wrong me, isn't that where the whole test is? And if basically it comes to this, you have wronged me, We're done. Where's the Christian love in that? The first challenge it comes to, it's over. No, listen, real Christian love isn't even put into action until there is a dispute, until there's a difference of opinion. And then you have brothers, you have sisters working together, praying together, asking God to give them the mind of Christ and bearing with one another in this way. You see, Jesus reminded us that there's no great credit if we love those who love us in return. You love those who love you, you're just like everybody else in the world. Real love is shown when you can love even when you're in disagreement with people. Going on, he says, that you may inherit a blessing. When we love one another, not only for the sake of Jesus, but also for the sake of our brothers and sisters, what do we do? We inherit a blessing. Listen, if you can't love one another for the sake of Jesus, if you can't love one another for the sake of the brother or sister sitting next to you, then love one another for your own selfish purpose so that you can inherit a blessing. It's like God's giving us every reason to love one another. And so we can do it for those three reasons, for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of one another, but we can even do it selfishly for ourselves because when you sacrificially love one another, then God will give you a blessing. Now he's gonna quote Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16, to demonstrate the blessing that comes from those who turn away from evil and do good. He says, for, quote, he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Do you want the eyes of the Lord to be upon you? Do you want his pleasant face to be upon you? Then turn away from evil, do good, love one another in Jesus' name. Now, if you're determined to live this kind of life, yes, I'm gonna love others. Yes, I'm gonna reach out to them even when it's difficult. Yes, I'm going to really be on the, the, the advancing point of, even when it's hard, I'm going to love and show grace to others. You know what? You're going to get smacked around. You will. 
you're gonna get mistreated when you decide to love that way. So what do you do? Verse 13. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Look at that phrase in verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. I can't love people the way you're telling me to love, Peter. If I do, I'm going to get worked by other people. I'm going to get abused by other people. I can't do that. And he says, you know what? If you do and you pay a price for that love, God will bless you. God will take care of you. Therefore, verse 14, don't be afraid of their threats. People try to intimidate you, to, to get you into thinking, well, I got to strike back. I got to do something inappropriate to preserve and to protect myself. No, he says, don't worry about it. God will help you to give a defense to everyone who asks you. By the way, I love how in the book of Acts, again and again, God supernaturally gave Peter the ability to give a defense in the needful moment. There he is before the crowd on the day of Pentecost. He gave a defense. There he is before the Sanhedrin. He gave a defense. There he is before the crowd in the great beautiful. He gave a defense. God gave him supernaturally the ability again and again to do it. But at the end of it all, verse 17, if it's necessary, it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Look, um, that's one of those verses that I can read to you and go, oh yeah, yes, brothers, yes, yes. Oh yes, sister. Are you kidding me? This, this is tough medicine. Can we just get real about this for a moment? I'm gonna read it to you again. T take the spiritual fog off of this one and let's just look at it real. It is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. I generally think it's not better to suffer any time. But he says, no, God can use your suffering, especially when you suffer for doing good. So look at it there in verse 18. He's going to show us why. He's going to show us the power of suffering for doing good when he says in verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. You want to know the greatest example of suffering and how God can bring great things through suffering? Look at Jesus himself. Jesus suffered once for sins. By the way, I love that phrase. It sounds like it's from the book of Hebrews, doesn't it? He suffered once for sins. There doesn't need to be a continual suffering of Jesus. He did it once for all. He paid the price, and he showed us that suffering can be worth it. I remember reading a sermon by Charles Spurgeon on this text. He recalled the heroic suffering of a man that's recorded in Fox's Book of Martyrs. I'll just read you the quote, quote, I remember reading in Fox's Book of Martyrs the story of a man of God who was bound to a stake to die for Christ. There he was, calm and quiet, till his legs had been burned away. And then the bystanders looked to see his helpless body drop from the chains as black as coal, and not a feature could be discerned, but one who was near was greatly surprised to see that poor black carcass open its mouth and two words came out of it. And what do you suppose those two words were? Sweet Jesus. And then the martyr fell over the chains and at last life was gone. Now Spurgeon relates to the fact that that saint had the sweet presence of Jesus to help him through the terrible suffering. This is what I want you to understand. When Jesus endured his suffering, he did not have the sweet 
presence of the Father helping him on the cross. On the cross, he endured the judgment and the wrath of the Father. He suffered all the sour that could ever be suffered so that sweetness could be injected even into the midst of our suffering. And then in verse 19, it gets a little weird. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient. We read that and we go, what? What is he talking about? Well, first of all, notice, he says, by whom? In verse 18, he said, um, notice this, in verse 18, he said um, that he was made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient. Well, Jesus was inspired by the Holy Spirit when he did this work of preaching to the spirits in prison. He was made alive by the Spirit, and then he did this work by the same Spirit. He went and preached to the spirits in prison. Apparently, this was done when Jesus, in the period after his death on the cross, but before his resurrection appearance to the disciples, Jesus went to Hades, the abode of the dead, and he preached to the spirits that were there. He preached to the spirits in prison. Now, some people have regarded these spirits as human spirits, it's more likely that the spirits mentioned in verse 19 were demonic spirits. We know that their disobedience was in the days of Noah. That's later on in verse 20. And we have evidence that the days of Noah were a time of gross sin for both humanity and the angelic realm. And Jesus seems to have preached to these imprisoned spirits. We don't know exactly what Jesus preached to them. In probability, it was not the proclamation of the gospel, but rather he preached a message of judgment and condemnation in light of his finished work on the cross. In doing this, there was a completion in Jesus' triumph over evil, even evil that happened before the flood. We're not trying to say that Jesus offered these disobedient spirits a second chance, but he said, I triumphed over evil on the cross, and now my triumph over all evil, including the evil you did way back at the flood, it is finished, it is complete. Now he mentions this further, picking up in the middle of verse 20. When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is, eight souls were saved through water. This is also an antitype of which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Peter goes to thinking of Jesus' work on the cross to his work in proclaiming the message of God's triumph to disobedient spirits in prison, no doubt in Hades, now to the work that God does in our life through baptism. And he's making a picture linking Noah to it all, that just as salvation from the judgment of God in Noah's day was connected with water, so the Christian salvation is connected with water, the water of baptism, as it's explained in verse 21. The water of the flood washed away sin and wickedness, and it brought a new world with a fresh start before God. Isn't that what the waters of the flood did? Well, the water of baptism does the same thing. It washes away wickedness. It's the illustration of our passing from the old unto the new. Now, there's some people who read this passage here in 1 Peter, and they say, Peter's preaching that it's the act of baptism that washes away our sins. No, he's not. He's making very plain that it's not it. Look at it here in verse 21. Not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Peter's being very careful to point out that it's not the actual washing of the water of baptism that saves us, but it's the spiritual reality behind the immersion in water. What really saves us 
is the answer of a good conscience before God, a conscience made good through the completed work of Jesus. That's what accomplishes our salvation. At the end of it all, baptism is an extremely important and meaningful physical representation of the work that happened when a person was born again. A person was cleansed of their sins and a person was dead with Jesus at the cross and risen again to new life. So a bath washes you, and there's a sense in which baptism is a bath, but it's also a burial under the water and a resurrection again. This illustrates the spiritual things that happen. Finally, he says in verse 22, that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. We see the completeness of Jesus' work by his exaltation to the right hand of God the Father and the subjection of all spirits unto him. All angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. So notice this. Notice how he draws together the thought. Though Jesus suffered for doing good, he had the ultimate victory. If you suffer for the sake of loving others for Jesus' sake, you may suffer for it, but you will ultimately triumph even as Jesus did. That's exactly the point that Peter is making to us. When we suffer for doing good, we will inherit a blessing. Here's the trick of it, isn't it? Just make sure you're suffering for doing good. God doesn't problem, God doesn't problem. <clears throat> Sometimes I get ahead of myself with my words. God doesn't promise blessing when we suffer for being jerks. But for doing righteousness, for love, God promises a blessing for that. So we're called to submission. We're called to unity and love. We're called to return evil that's done to us with good instead of the evil that was done to us. And we are called to endure suffering as Jesus did. And in doing all of that, you will inherit a blessing. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing more important for your life than to be blessed. It's better to be blessed than to be smart. It's better to be blessed than to be rich. It's better to be blessed than to be beautiful. It's better to be blessed than to be lucky. The blessing of God is the greatest thing that you can have in your life. And suffering for righteousness' sake does not forfeit that blessing. It walks right into it if we trust God along the way. So, Father, I pray especially, Lord, for any here tonight who are suffering or have suffering on their horizon. Lord, I pray that you would give them the grace and the wisdom and the power of Jesus to truly commit their suffering unto you so that any of it would be done for Jesus' sake and not for the sake of the flesh or of contention or of anything else that we might think of. Lord, but no, it's done for your sake. Lord, we don't want a single bit of our suffering to be wasted. Lord, we pray that we would not waste our sorrows, but that every one of them would be redemptive as it's committed to Jesus Christ. Fill us with this heart and this spirit, Lord. Give special comfort to your suffering saints here this evening, Lord. We pray in Jesus' wonderful name.